Good afternoon and welcome to today's STS-135 mission status briefing, the first for the final mission of Atlantis. Uh, we have uh, today Quetzal Barujo, the lead flight director for this mission. He'll start off with some opening comments and then we'll move on to your questions. Quatsi. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon to some of you. Uh, we've had an absolutely outstanding uh, morning on orbit. Today we executed the inspection of the shuttle's thermal protection system uh, that was carried out by uh, manipulating the shuttle's robotic arm as well as the orbiter boom sensor system uh, to do detailed scans of the wing leading edge, the shuttle's nose cap, and uh, other areas uh, associated with ground support umbilicals. Those scans were executed in absolute professional style by our crew, uh, led by Commander Chris Ferguson, Pilot Doug Hurley, Mission Specialist Sandy Magnus, and Rex Walheim. They got through all of the activities of, uh, of the inspection and uh, ended up running about an hour to uh, an hour and a half in, uh, ahead of time. Now, as far as the efficiencies that they gained in, in executing the activities, uh, about 30 to 35 minutes of, of, uh, of that time was, was due to them just executing things uh, quite well and being very efficient. Uh, but they also chose to work through their, their lunch break. We get, typically give them about an hour for lunch. And so because they worked through their lunch break to try to get ahead of the timeline, uh, we ended up completing the inspections uh, an hour ahead of schedule. What the crew has left on their day today is a uh, check out of their rendezvous tools, uh, as well as check out of the uh, orbiter docking system. Both of these are required in preparation for uh, rendezvous and docking tomorrow. Additionally, we have uh, a, a second of, of two rendezvous burns that were on the plan today. Uh, we executed the so-called NC2 burn earlier today, and now we're going to execute uh, the NC3 burn in just a couple of hours. We're going to do that uh, that burn about an hour and a half earlier than we had originally scheduled it in the timeline. Uh, and, and basically that's to uh, give the crew credit for finishing the TPS inspections early. We'll let them do their rendezvous burn early and thus uh, we can give them a little bit more of a relaxed pre-sleep time frame tonight so that they won't be as fatigued going into the uh, critical phases of rendezvous and docking in the morning. We uh, continue to observe stellar performance from Atlantis. Uh, the ship has been performing in beautiful fashion. We're not tracking any significant issues. Uh, the spacecraft and uh, her crew all seem to be doing very well. And honestly, we, we couldn't be more happy with what we've seen from the crew and uh, from Atlantis uh, in this first half of flight day two. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, a productive rest of the afternoon. Uh, looking forward to putting the crew to bed uh, on time. Uh, they may even have uh, have some time to, to get to bed a little early if they wish. And I think we'll be in, uh, in good shape for uh, an excellent rendezvous and docking with the International Space Station tomorrow. Uh, that concludes my opening comments and uh, we'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, we'll start here with questions at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and then we'll move on to our phone bridge participants. Uh, questions from here in Houston, Philip? Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, the crew got, as you said, the crew got way ahead of the timeline today on the inspections. Um, is that typical for them? Uh, and uh, do you think that's going to help you uh, in the during the docked phase with all of the work that needs to be done? Okay, those are great questions. Uh, the performance of of uh, the activities on flight day two uh, are often subject to a lot of variability. Uh, depends on. Uh, the crews, how the crews are feeling, uh, as well as, as uh, the overall tasking, uh, the number of people we have on the flight deck. Today, I think we had a lot of things working in our favor. First of all, even though we did have a, uh, we do have a, a smaller crew, and of course that tends to um, uh, put pressure on getting the activities completed on time. We did have fewer bodies to, for the crew to trip over. Uh, also, we are flying a, a very experienced crew that knows how to adapt to space conditions. And so uh, I think their, their adaptation to space has, has gone uh, very quickly uh, relative to, to what we sometimes see from, from, from other crews. And so all of these things taken in tandem, their experience uh, really allowed us to, uh, to get ahead on the timeline and to execute things efficiently. So. Uh, we're quite pleased. Uh, it, it, we have seen this type of performance before, although I, I, I think 
the performance of this particular crew on this set of activities is is probably near record breaking. I think we we really uh, were able to to squeeze out considerable efficiencies from this crew today. Mark? Uh, thanks, Mark Caro for Aviation Week. I had a couple of questions. Uh, one, I wonder during the inspection, at least from what you could see in the control center, did anything jump out, or did you see basically pretty uh, normal uh, TPS? Okay. Another great question. Uh, we did not see anything so far uh, that gave us great pause, nothing that was uh, that was immediately visible to the naked eye. Now, of course, uh, as you know, the process of analyzing the data we get from the sensor package on the OBSS uh, takes uh, several hours, and uh, we do expect that process to go normally. So we'll hear official word uh, concerning the condition of the uh, the, the reinforced carbon-carbon uh, components of the thermal protection system. We'll probably hear that late tomorrow, uh, maybe uh, maybe early in, in the morning, depending on how the engineers are doing. But there was nothing that uh, that immediately gave us pause or that we were concerned about going into the inspection. And we also saw very good debris performance from the tank on the way uphill yesterday. So uh, that also uh, that also uh, was very encouraging to us. And in fact, uh, we were extremely happy with the launch yesterday, as you can imagine, which uh, is a testament not only to the uh, the excellent performance of the, the team there at Kennedy Space Center, but also uh, the, the wonderful performance of the Ascent team under the leadership of uh, Mr. Richard Jones. So we uh, were very comfortable and very happy looking at the TPS going into the inspection today, and uh, we'll see what the detailed scans reveal to us uh, tomorrow. Thanks. My, my other uh, question sort of had to do with the uh, the pace of work. You, you mentioned today that the uh, that uh, Chris Ferguson and his crew got ahead uh, 60 to 90 minutes. In fact, um, there's a lot to do on this mission, and I wonder how cognizant you are in the control center of, of trying to kind of stay up on everything so that you don't fall behind. And, and I guess that's kind of a, a quality, not a quantitative question, but I just wonder how conscious you are of trying to make sure that they they don't fall back into a corner where they can't dig themselves out. Thanks. Okay. For all of the, the controllers in, in on the flight control team, starting with the, the flight director, myself, uh, our Capcom, as well as the other controllers, we all try to imagine ourselves uh, executing the activities that the crew has to execute. Uh, each systems uh, discipline specialist in the flight control room monitors their activities and and our, our our first mandate really is to to stay abreast of what the crew is doing and try to imagine and visualize what they're doing as they prepare to throw switches uh, as they are executing uh, robotics operations uh, as they work today for the for the TPS inspection and and the benefit that we as mission controllers can provide to the crew is that we can having Imagine what they are doing and, 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 and having focused intently on each of their tasks, we can try to anticipate areas where they might uh, run into problems, areas where they might have some tasking conflicts, and recommend some, uh, some, some redirection, if you will, uh, or some additional efficiencies which might not have been built uh, into the pre-flight timeline and, and which the crew themselves might not have been able to think of. And so that's one of the things that worked in our favor today is, is we, we had not only wonderful performance from the crew, but my flight control team also did uh, a fantastic job doing what I asked them to do and what, what they have trained to do, which is to look ahead, uh, to stay in perfect lockstep with the crew. And we actually did recommend some, uh, some surgical uh, uh, changes to the sequence of, uh, of events uh, that allowed them to to extract the maximum efficiency from from uh, from their great performance. Dan Vergano with USA Today. I had two questions. The first is, could you discuss a little bit about what goes into the decision about extending the mission at this point? Is it mostly how much fuel and propellant gets used in the maneuver with the space station tomorrow, or is it sort of overall performance that sort of builds you the, the margin to do that? Okay, it's uh, it's actually all the above uh, as far as uh, what what goes into our decision to extend a day. Uh, in fact, I'm glad you asked that because we we do have uh, have some uh, runtime on our fuel cells. And and what I can report to you today is that with respect to our most limiting consumable, which in this case is the cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen required to generate electrical power, uh, with respect to those consumables, we lift it off uh, with sufficient oxygen and hydrogen to uh, to give us uh, what we believe is about 22 to 23 hours 
uh, above our nominal 12 plus 0 plus 2 day timeline. So we are executing the uh, power conserving measures that we uh, developed pre-flight. And so uh, we're going to continue to watch the system over the next day or two. And I fully expect that uh, by about flight day four, uh, we'll be able to report to you that, that we are seeing uh, stable enough margins to where we can recommend extending a day. Uh, we carried sufficient propellant to orbit with us to, uh, to extend a day with no problem. And as I said, we've got sufficient quantity of other consumables and, and the crew seems to be doing very well. So I think we will probably get there. Uh, again, uh, don't take that to the bank until, uh, until, until we talk in another day or two. But right now, everything is, is, is on track for us to be able to extend a day as long as we continue to see good performance from the crew, good performance from the spacecraft, and as long as the other mission activities uh, go nominally. And my second question was regarding just the uh, quickness with which they were able to do the inspection today. Could you, just to, maybe I'm repeating that with the previous question, but how much of that was this sort of crew being doing this a good job at this and how much of it was not seeing any marks that made you or problems that made you stop and uh, inspect more carefully the position okay well let me uh, let me further address by saying that that the the presence or absence of any issues or any uh, occlusions or imperfections in the thermal pr protection system uh, that has no bearing on the amount of time that that it takes uh, we have a very set uh, pattern of scan uh, over the RCC that we will execute in all cases, whether there are, are any areas of concern. Now, if there are areas of concern that we identify uh, prior to the scan, uh, we may uh, may take uh, an additional time to stop and stare, if you will, uh, once we get to that point in in the scan. But uh, but but generally, that has no bearing on it. What uh, what really allowed us to get from the beginning of the, the TPS inspection to the end this time as quickly as we did, I believe was, was a positive convergence of all of the positive behaviors that we've tried to build into this aspect of the mission. Starting with the flight plan, uh, our uh, flight activities officer and uh, other planners put together a very efficient sequence of events uh, in cooperation with all of the, the various uh, subsystem owners who, uh, who make the inputs. So we, we started with an efficient plan. Uh, the training team contributed tremendously to the success today in training our crew to uh, execute these activities efficiently, as well as training the flight control team and training us together and challenging us to think about where we can extract further efficiencies. And then, of course, there is the actual on-orbit crew who is, is very experienced in, and have given great attention to finding ways to be efficient uh, and finding ways to leverage the, uh, the, the, the human resource that they have on board in the best possible manner. So you put all of these things together and, uh, and it, it, it ended up working to our benefit today. In past missions, uh, we may have uh, uh, great performance in say three out of four of these areas and, and we may finish on time or may finish only slightly later than we planned. Uh, and in other missions, we might see some uh, uh, some misalignment with respect to uh, satellite availability and, and our ability to get the sensor data down in real time uh, as, as, uh, as well as we did today. So it, it really is a combination of all of these factors, uh, which no one of which is, is more important than the other in my view, uh, that, have really, uh, that have really worked to, to the good today. So hopefully that, that helps explain that a bit more. Okay, we're going to go now to questions from the phone bridge. I think first on our list is the Associated Press. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, Seth Borenstein at AP, and if I, I do have a follow-up. Just um, going that you're saying you said you were on a near record uh, pace for efficiency here. Also, uh, you can't help but notice when looking at the uh, um, flight uh, execute package, no anomalies whatsoever. I'm wondering if you can look at this, and have you seen such a clean first full day in orbit combined with such a such an efficient day um, I'm wondering if this is you know once you've got into orbit one of the um, cleanest best most efficient flights you've seen I mean I know you you're uh, relatively new in the position but in general is this one of the best uh, so starts so far to a mission 
I think this is certainly one of the better starts that we have seen. And, and I'll tell you, one area where I think that Atlantis has really helped us is the, uh, the absence of anomalies uh, also equals uh, the relative absence of distraction from the efficiencies that you try to gain in executing the nominal timeline. You know, even though we, we haven't had really serious problems with the shuttle in a while, uh, when you do have the random heater failure or uh, a sensor bias or some other uh, little thing, you know, we go through uh, a fairly rigorous process to try to examine anomalies and to try to make sure that they are not symptoms of uh, more serious problems that might be threatening to the, the mission or threatening to the spacecraft or crew. And so uh, examining every failure or every anomaly that we have does take a considerable mental resource on the part of our flight control team. The relative absence of that, I think, has allowed our team to focus more on executing the, the nominal timeline. And so uh, one has to believe that that's, that's helped contribute to the the efficiency of today so far. Follow up on that. Here you are. It is one of the cleanest, best flights ever. It is also the last one. Um, care to, to, I mean, is, don't you find it a little ironic and disturbing that here you're reaching sort of the pinnacle of efficiency and and you know just flying well and and it ends. Um, in a way, wouldn't it be easier if, if the shuttles were showing their age at the end than showing um, just maturity instead of age? Yeah, I can certainly appreciate your, your observation. I personally, instead of focusing on the, the irony, I, I tend to look at the opportunity. Uh, on this, the last shuttle mission of the program, uh, I'm very grateful that the spacecraft is behaving as well as it is uh, so that we can finish strong, uh, finish safely. As, uh, as you all have heard me say before, my team's number one focus is on ending this mission and ending the program uh, as safely as, as we have flown last missions. And so uh, the, 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 the great condition of the spacecraft is, is really helping us to, uh, to do that so far. And uh, I see that as a tremendous, uh, tremendous opportunity uh, it helps us in, in, enjoy the mission more, honestly, uh, when we're not as worried about falling behind the timeline. And of course, we still have to be very vigilant. Uh, you know, this is just flight day two. We've got we've got plenty more opportunities to fall behind and experience problems, but we'll we'll do our best to avoid that. Okay, I think next up is CBS. Uh, yeah, hey, Quatsy, it's Bill Harwood. Uh, just a real quick one. Looking ahead to docking. Can you talk a little bit in detail about what the crew does with four people on board for docking that, that makes it a little more of a challenge than when you have, say, six or seven on board? Thanks. Sure thing. Uh, the, the big thing for, for my team to, to be cognizant of and the, and the thing that we have put some extra emphasis on in training is the fact that as we get to those closer terminal phases uh, of the approach and docking, pretty much all of the crew members, all four of them, will be on the flight deck, each of them uh, playing a different and critical role in, uh, in, in actually executing the, the safe approach and docking. For instance, Commander Chris Ferguson will, will be at the stick, if you will, uh, controlling the thrusters and, and guiding the spacecraft into the approach and docking. Uh, pilot Doug Hurley will be uh, assisting with uh, management of the guidance, navigation, and control system, uh, management of the autopilot, uh, management of uh, the thruster configurations, which have to change a few times uh, between the various phases of the approach and docking. Uh, mission specialists Sandy Magnus and Rex Walheim will be uh, doing a combination of communicating with the ground as well as uh, uh, sighting on the International Space Station with the uh, manual uh, range finding devices like the handheld laser. And so when you think about uh, the flow of things that, that have to occur there on the flight deck for a successful approach and docking, all four of them will really be engaged, uh, especially as we get very close, uh, after we execute the RPM and, uh, and start to maneuver onto the V-bar for the final approach. And so what that means for us is that uh, if there are sort of any random things, and I don't want to say necessarily random, but, but miscellaneous things is a good term, uh, miscellaneous systems reconfigurations that have to be done, uh, because we're going to be 
filling water bags to prepare to transfer to the ISS, which means that we'll have some switch throws that we have to uh, execute from time to time to fill the water, uh, to start the fills, stop the fills, change bags, uh, reconfigure the pressure control system to manage the pressure in the cabin, various other ancillary things that are not directly related to actually physically flying the bird. Uh, those things we've got fewer hands and, and fewer minds available to really give attention to those things, which means that for MCC, we have to be much more surgical in how we call up those instructions and in how we manage the systems, because we're used to having plenty of people around, either on the mid-deck or the flight deck, to, uh, to reconfigure the heaters on the cryogenic oxygen and, nitrogen and uh, hydrogen tanks, or to uh, start and stop uh, water bag fills. Uh, we just have to be a little bit more judicious about how we uh, how we manage those systems so that we can delay those calls when appropriate and uh, and get them in when we've got the opportunity. Anything else from you, Bill? Well, we're not hearing uh, Mr. Harwood any further, so let's move on to Tarek Malik with Space.com. Uh, thank you very much, Kwasi, uh, uh, at uh, TarkMountainSpace.com, and I've got, uh, I think, one in uh, a follow-up. Um, one is uh, 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 referring to the, um, uh, the surveys today. You mentioned uh, near uh, uh, record-breaking uh, or record-setting uh, for the cruise performance today. I was wondering if you had kind of an exact um, number in terms of how long it took or, or if they had a really efficient number of, uh, of robotic arm moves. If you had any of those kinds of statistics um, for the survey today, that would be great. Uh, I apologize, Tark. I, I, I really don't. Uh, I'd have to, to go back through all of the, the previous uh, TPS surveys that we've done. Uh, typically, the crews do run. Um, they're either able to get ahead or finish on time uh, by working through lunch. In fact, I dare say most of the crews uh, work through their lunch time uh, to do the inspections. Uh, a lot of times what we will see and what is typical uh, of, the, of the Flight Day 2 inspections is that we, we tend to run a bit behind on uh, executing the first part of the inspection, which is the uh, starboard wing survey. Uh, we tend to run behind sometimes because uh, either uh, communication uh, coverage uh, for the satellites uh, doesn't line up for us because we share those satellites with other users, of course. Uh, and so sometimes that might delay us in, in execution of, uh, of, of, uh, of some of the activities. Uh, sometimes the crews are just a little bit slower because they, they just might not be feeling as well uh, due to space adaptation, and therefore they take a little bit of extra time to make sure that they do things right, given that they're not necessarily feeling at their, at their peak. And so what we usually see, I would say, Tarek, more often than not, what we usually see is that for the first uh, one or two uh, phases of the inspection, we are running a bit behind, and then we sort of make up the deficit by working through the crew's lunch such that at the end of the day, we've sort of ended on time. And so what was very unusual about today is that uh, we didn't fall behind at all, but we actually ran ahead, and the crew still chose to contribute their uh, their, their lunch period to to work through uh, the inspections, and therefore we ended up getting very far ahead. So, I'm sorry I don't have an exact figure for you, but that's probably the best way I could describe what's happened today. Thank you. Um, I think I, have, uh, I think just uh, two more real quick ones. Uh, I'm just wondering, with there only being four folks on the uh, on the shuttle, um, if they've kind of mentioned at all to Mission Control, uh, e even in passing, uh, if it does feel a bit more roomier, um, if it's a little bit more comfortable, um, if they've, they've told you anything like that. Okay, the uh, the crew has not mentioned anything about that to us. Uh, however, um, as a flight director, I've gone through much of the training that the crew has gone through, at least a lot of the the. the uh, the mock-up training and, and, and classroom training that, they, that they've gone through as part of my own certification. Uh, and my Capcom, uh, who's a flown astronaut, uh, Dr. Steve Robinson, uh, who's a, a veteran space flyer, uh, he very much helps calibrate us on what the cruise conditions might be. And, and uh, we, we understand sort of what they're doing from minute to minute and from activity to activity. And we know for a fact that that the shuttle definitely feels roomier to them. Uh, in fact, it, it, it's probably usually uh, much more cramped with six or seven people on board than, than we usually hear, because astronauts really don't, don't, don't like to complain at all. Uh, 
so uh, we know that that, that uh, is creating some great conditions for them. Uh, it's probably uh, helping the environment as far as the the air quality and the air temperature uh, feel much more comfortable to them without uh, without an additional two or three bodies uh, throwing heat and CO2 into the atmosphere. So all these things, I think uh, they're probably uh, they're probably uh, quite comfortable right now. Thank you. And just my last question, I know that you started out uh, uh, work on, on, on the station before switching to shuttle flight control, and tomorrow will be the, uh, the last shuttle docking at uh, the space station. And I'm wondering if, uh, what that might mean uh, to you and to your team, and if you have any insights what that might mean to the, uh, the crew, because uh, I know they'll be busy with the actions as opposed to with the reflecting on, on, on the moment uh, in the morning tomorrow. Thanks. Well, with each mission, there are several events that really are defining moments, I believe, uh, several nominal events that are defining moments in the mission. Uh, launch, of course, is, is, uh, is, is one of the most important. Landing is one of the most important. Um, docking and, and undocking, uh, as well as the EVAs, uh, whenever there are EVAs on, a, on a, a mission, those tend to be defining moments and very uh, unique and, and well-defined milestones. Uh, the docking tomorrow uh, represents one of those milestones uh, to me that will be uh, a significant uh, hurdle uh, as far as uh, accomplishing the, the mission and concluding it safely. And so, uh, you know, my team generally tends to feel uh, a great sense of uh, relief and accomplishment uh, whenever we successfully dock a shuttle to the International Space Station. Space Station team, I know, feels the same way because I've I've been in that uh, been in that boat and, and have worked uh, worked a, a rendezvous and docking on the station side as well. Uh, for me personally, uh, I, I consider it uh, really a, a tremendous honor um, to use a term I, 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 I you know that we heard earlier, almost ironic uh, that uh, that I as a, a homegrown space station flight controller and somebody that started uh, my flight director career on the space station side uh, has the the privilege and, and it really is a privilege. Uh, to be able to uh, guide the, the very last space shuttle to its uh, very last docking with the International Space Station. I, I still feel a tremendous sense of responsibility for the space station, even when I'm uh, at the helm of the shuttle flight control team. And uh, I feel a, a tremendous responsibility for the space shuttle, obviously. And so uh, I just feel a great sense of gratitude, really, at being able to participate in uh, this historic uh, rendezvous and docking. No. Okay, we'll move on to Florida Today. Thanks very much, James Dean from Florida Today. Um, Kwasi, just kind of following up on, on that last question uh, as you're reflecting on this stuff, um, the, the RPM, if, if not a defining moment, certainly among the more dramatic that we get to see uh, during flights. Um, so uh, just wondering... Uh, uh, maybe that's something you have a chance to sort of uh, take in and enjoy more um, as opposed to the intensity of the, the docking operation. And uh, specifically, I was wondering, I don't remember uh, seeing that 1,000-millimeter camera. Um, do you have extra cameras on, on this uh, RPM, for, or, or if so, for any reason? Okay. On the last mission, as you know, we did use the, uh, the camera with the 1,000-millimeter lens um, to uh, take pictures of, of uh Endeavor's TPS system, uh, Endeavor's tiles, just to give us some higher resolution pictures. The the 800 millimeter uh, lens photos and the 400 that are standard, uh, they're more than sufficient. The uh, the 1,000 millimeter uh, uh, photos just gave us uh, even better data. Uh, we plan to uh, get uh, 1,000 millimeter photos on this RPM as well. Uh, so we do have that called out in the uh, the crew's timeline, and they're prepared to do that uh, unless. There are some problems that arise or, or some tasking issues that arise for the station crew that, that would preclude that. Uh, for this RPM tomorrow, uh, I'm very much hoping that we, we end up having a good, uh, good uh, KU band, high data rate uh, comm coverage from the International Space Station. Uh, on my last uh, shuttle flight as lead flight director, that was uh, STS-130 in February of, of 2010, uh, we were fortunate because the trajectory uh, for, the, for that launch worked out such that uh, we had good uh, line of sight with the ISS high rate communication system and the ISS was able to downlink in real time uh, video of the, uh, the shuttle and Endeavor 
uh, for that mission uh, performing its R RPM. And that was a very, very special moment for my controllers uh, in the shuttle flight control room who were, were uh, heavily engaged in, in that rendezvous and docking. Uh, I'm hoping that we have similar luck tomorrow. Uh, if we don't, then of course we'll do uh, what we normally do, which is uh, again, focus intensely on, on, uh, on, on the execution of the activities, watch the data uh, so that we can, can help the crew but uh, hopefully we've got some, some good visuals that, uh, that we can get in real time to really uh, um, commemorate, I should say, uh, and help us enjoy these moments. Um, one of the things that I, I do think about on the rare occasion that, that I'm not thinking about actual mission execution, I think about something that Gene Cran said in, uh, in, in one of the specials that was, that was filmed about the Apollo era, how uh, when he looks back on it, he, uh, he remembers that, that he and his team, uh, in his words, didn't, didn't really enjoy the moment of uh, landing on the moon as much as many other people did because they were so intensely focused on, on the tasks that they had to perform, uh, which were uh, monitoring the health and performance of the spacecraft, making sure everything went well, making sure that, that nobody got hurt or killed as they, as they uh, attempted to land on the moon and, and, uh, and as the astronauts stepped out on the moon. Obviously, our priority is monitoring the spacecraft, making sure that everything is executed flawlessly. Um, but being able to, to see pictures in real time whenever we are fortunate enough to be able to get that uh, without, uh, without having to, to downlink it later, those are just bonuses that uh, make the moment uh, special so that uh, these people with whom uh, I have the privilege of, of sharing this mission, you know, we can look each other in the eye and, and, and you know, today and, and tomorrow and, and maybe a year or so from now and say, wow, do you remember when we, we saw Atlantis uh, doing a, a backflip uh, underneath the space station for the very last time? Wow, wasn't that special? So we'll see. Thanks. Um, I also just want to ask you, you've mentioned uh, space adaptation a couple times. Can, can you speak a little bit to, um, you know, what's typical for, uh, you know, any given crew or crew member to experience? And um, I mean, I know it varies, every individual, individual is different, but is it something that um, having flown before, you know, automatically makes less likely or there's, are, there's things these guys would learn to do to, to mitigate it? Or is it just kind of random or lucky uh, whether, you, whether you feel it or not? You know, it's a, it's a very complex subject. Uh, one of the things that's fortunate is we have a, a tremendous amount of, of data uh, from human subjects on space adaptation. Uh, one of the things that we've seen from the data is that uh, uh, there is considerable variability based on, on crew members. There are some crew members who uh, have flown in space for the very first time and barely get sick or barely have any issues. There are some crew members uh, who are veteran flyers and uh, they, you know, have, have, have uh, some uh, discomfort like clockwork. Uh, one of the things that we do know is that there are some uh, some countermeasures. There's some medical, uh, there's some uh, pharmacological countermeasures. There are just uh, some good practice sort of things uh, that uh, that help with adaptation. And 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 although there is not a direct physiological correlation between uh, the number of times a person's flown in space and how quickly they adapt, uh, some of those um, the procedural countermeasures, those things that that tend to help crew members adapt. If you have flown before, they tend to know those things. They tend to be very uh, uh, well versed in, in what has worked for them in the past and what doesn't work. And so that might provide a, a bit of an advantage. And of course, uh, each of these uh, crew members is, is a, a flown crew member. So uh, again, that's, that's not a precise answer, but, but then again, we know that when we're talking about uh, human physiology, there are relatively few precise answers because people are different. Just last real quick follow up. Is it basically nausea we're talking about, or is it like dizziness or any, any, anything else? Uh, all of the above. Thanks. OK. We'll bring the questions back here to Johnson Space Center. Phil? Phil Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com again. Uh, a, book, a bookkeeping question on your crown margins. Um, do you need to get 24 hours above, above your 12 plus zero, or is it more than that? Okay, great question. Uh, for us to to really in in um, in good conscience commit to an extra energy dependent day, uh, we like to see at least some positive margin above the additional day. So, for instance, uh, our baseline mission duration for this flight is 12 plus zero plus two. 
Uh, at launch, uh, we were able to show about 23 hours. So for us to commit to the extra day, we want to see uh, well over 24 hours. Uh, it doesn't have to be 24 and a half per se, but, but if we are showing uh, a stable amount of margin that's, uh, that's over uh, 24 so that we know we've got that extra day sort of in the bank, uh, that's, pretty much, uh, that's pretty much what would, would give us a lot of confidence uh, that we can, we can uh, uh, count on that extra day. Okay. Anything else here? All right, with that, uh, we'll uh, wrap up this briefing. Just a look ahead on the television schedule. We'll have today's mission management team briefing at 3 p.m. Central, 4 Eastern. And then uh, Atlantis's crew is scheduled to go to sleep at 6.29 p.m. Central, 7.29 Eastern. Remember that all the latest information on the STS-135 mission is available on the Internet at www.nasa.gov. Thanks for coming. Hi, I'm James O'Connor. I'm Christina Gasling. I'm Kevin Metrikavage. I'm Moose Kimball. I'm Jonathan Huffman. And I'm Pooja Joshi. We are the Attitude Determination Control Officer team on the final shuttle mission. And, and you're, you're watching, watching NASA TV. TV.